and uh, I'm pretty sure Sir Richard will uh, remember this picture. You can see him here. And uh, this was my first meeting with Sir Richard as Sir Richard in 2019 when I was invited to uh, come for an award. Um, and since then, I've been fortunate to continue corresponding with uh, Sir Richard. Uh, if you're a scientist, you know how it feels to be able to have a Nobel you know, Prize winner you know, as a mentor or someone who can at least say, say a few things to you. So you know, I've been fortunate to have that. But I'm not gonna waste time, but I'm gonna now give a brief background about Sir Richard before I let him speak. So Sir Richard is the Chief Scientific Officer at New England Biolabs. He was educated in England, attending St. Stephen's School and the, uh, and the City of Bath Boys School in Bath before moving to the University of Sheffield, where he obtained a BSc in chemistry in 1965 and a PhD in organic chemistry in 1968. His postdoctoral, postdoctoral research was carried out in Professor J.L. Strominga's laboratory at Harvard, where he studied the transfer RNAs involved in the biosynthesis of bacterial cell walls. From 1972 to 1992, he worked at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, reaching the position of Assistant Director for Research under uh, Dr. J.D. Watson, the co-discoverer of the uh, uh, structure of the DNA. Um, Sir Richard won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1993 for the discovery of split genes with Philip Sharp. His discovery of the alternative splicing of genes in particular has had a profound impact on the study and applications of molecular biology. Previously based on studies of bacterial DNA, biologists believe that genes consisted of unbroken stretches of DNA, all of which encoded protein structure. It has since been established that the discontinuous gene structure discovered by Roberts and Sharp is the most common structure found in higher organisms. And Richard's research in this field resulted in a fundamental shift in our understanding of genetics and led to the discovery of split genes in higher organisms, including human beings. Their discovery led to the decisive progress in many fields, including cancer research. And also Richard's laboratory also pioneered the application of computers in area of nucleic acid sequencing. Richard also won the Golden Plate Award of the American Academy of Achievement in 1994. He is a fellow of numerous academic societies, including the Royal Society. He is also highly sought after scientific advisor. So as you probably noticed, we are so, so lucky and so fortunate to have him speak to us in this uh, symposium. And uh, he was knighted in 2008 for his services to science and received the Sir Hans Krebs Medal in 2013 from the Federation of European Biochemical Societies. In 2005, a multi-million pound expansion to the chemistry department at the University of Sheffield, where he had been a student, was named after him. In addition, he is the chairman of the Laureate Science Alliance, nonprofit supporting research worldwide. In 2016, Roberts and other novelists composed and signed a laureate's letter supporting precision agriculture addressed to the leaders of Greenpeace, uh, the United Nations, and the global government. And Sir Robert has advocated for genetically modified organisms in general and golden rice in particular to advance health in developing countries, noting the high safety records of goods uh, of GM foods. Um, I'm going to stop there, but uh, you know, I just want to emphasize how lucky and fortunate we are to have someone like Sir Richard giving a talk to us in a small place like Yobe State, even though it's virtual, we have you know, uh, attendees from all around the world, but it's such a great honor to have you, Sir Richard. I'm going to give you the floor now. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mahmoud. It's um, always a little embarrassing to hear these introductions. But one thing you said I will talk about, which is the pro-GMO movement. Um, but what I wanted to do was to start off to talk to you about some of the opportunities, I think, um, that lie available for African scientists. A couple of areas where I think African scientists will be able to make a big difference, both to science, but also to the population within Africa. And of course, the two issues which are on top of a lot of people's minds 
First, of course, is COVID, which is causing immense problems all over the world. There is also a big problem in Africa and many developing countries with food and hence the GMOs. But let me start off a little bit about talking about COVID, about the things that might be possible. And in particular, I think COVID as well as GMOs have shown the tremendous opportunities that biotechnology offer for scientists. Thanks to recent developments, those advances that can be made both in GMOs and in vaccine production or in testing for COVID are all things that can be implemented in Africa very easily. They are things that can be developed by African scientists. You, you don't need help from the West very often in order to make advances, especially in the GMO area. But let me start by talking a little bit about COVID. There are two issues with COVID where biotech has really come through in a major way to show just how important it is for the future of mankind. The first of these, of course, was the testing that became possible. And what is very well known tends to be the PCR approach to testing, whereby you take a, a sample, a nasal sample or a saliva sample, purify to some extent the RNA, amplify it, and then test to see if it is COVID. There are even simpler methods of doing that. The problem with the PCR approach is it requires um, quite sophisticated equipment that is often not available and certainly is not readily available out in the field where you would really like to do the testing. We have come up with something which we call colorimetric lamp. It's an isothermal amplification technique that was originally developed in Japan. And we added a, a simple detection method for it involving a color change. Basically, um, you can spit into a test tube you can amplify the RNA that is present without doing really anything to the saliva sample. You can make DNA copies of the RNA. And in this way, as you amplify it, you produce protons and that results in a change in pH. And so you can get a simple color change from pink to yellow, which will tell you whether you have COVID or not. The whole thing takes about 30 minutes doesn't require sophisticated equipment, although if you want to do it on a very large scale, you can automate much of the process, but it's ideal to go out into the field, take it out, spit in a tube, run the react, heat it up a little bit, run the reaction at one temperature and look for the color change. If you get the color change, then you have a COVID positive response. And this is something that is a method we developed many years ago at New England Biolabs, and we had been using it actually in Africa and in South America to test for parasites. Um, it's something that was easily ad adapted so that it could work with COVID. And we worked with a group in China in order to get it going, and it worked out to be extremely useful. We test every employee in our company once a week using this approach. And we've also made kits available to a number of labs in Africa, um, including one in Nigeria. The other remarkable advance that took place during the last year was this new novel method of creating vaccines. I think the mRNA vaccines, which have turned out to be enormously successful for COVID, were the result of some many, many years of work um, most of it pretty unknown, except to a few people, uh, but picked up by Moderna and also picked up by Pfizer. And what it did was to really allow vaccines to be developed in record time. In fact, it was about eight to nine months from the time that the vaccine was developed to the time that it was first approved in the US. This is also a method of making vaccines that can work for many other diseases. And it's also something that could be used and developed in Africa. And one of the things that the Nobel Prize winners have been involved in was a campaign to make sure 
that the patent rights on these mRNA vaccines in the US are going to be waived and they will be waived for Africa. Now, there's still quite a lot of improvements that are needed in order to make it simpler to make these vaccines. Um, at the moment, it's quite a complicated process, but Moderna at least have offered to help <coughs> train individuals so that they can be made. And I think you will see this can have an enormous impact in the developing world. Um, I and many of my Nobel colleagues are considered very worried about the fact that the vaccines have been really lapped up by the developed countries and are not so available in the developing world. Although hopefully that will change, at least from the US, there has been some indication that a lot of doses are going to be made available um, to COVAX and to other organizations that are distributing them in the developing world. But I think in years to come, it will be possible for the scientists in the developing world to make these vaccines themselves relatively easily and to lose this dependence on the West. And I think this is something that is desperately needed is for scientists in Africa and elsewhere to develop their own scientists, to develop their own methodologies and to develop laboratories and companies that can help to advance medicine and also to advance agriculture. And agriculture is the second thing that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that GMOs, the GMO technique, this idea that you can quickly change and introduce genes into plants by techniques that were developed in the 1980s by Mark Van Montague and his colleagues can make a huge difference when it comes to developing novel plants. And one of the reasons that food is so plentiful in the developed countries is that they've spent a huge amount of money, the agricultural companies, to improve the crops. And they've done it for the most part by traditional plant breeding because that was all that was available. But nevertheless, given the resources that went into it, they've made vast improvements in agriculture. Unfortunately, those same companies didn't think they could make money in Africa or the developing world. And so they didn't bother to try to improve the crops that are available and that is, are eaten in really many, many different countries, crops that we don't typically eat in the West. As a result of that, this means that many of the crops that are grown in the developing world could be improved quite significantly. And I think the big advantage that one has to realize that the GMO approach gives is that you can do it quickly. Traditional plant breeding takes an awful long time, but with CRISPR techniques, with other um, GM techniques, you can do amazing things in a short period of time. So for instance, in Uganda, um, bananas have become a big problem. Um, many diseases affect bananas, but one of them, Xanthomonas wilt, is a bacterial disease, destroys bananas. Scientists in Kenya realized that they could overcome this because there are a couple of genes that are found in sweet peppers that can be moved into bananas, and then bananas are resistant to Xanthomonas wilt. This is just one of many examples where you can improve crops, improve the yields of crops and make a really big difference to the farmers and to the population that depends on them. And I think this is something that we must make sure is widely adopted in Africa, in South America, in India and elsewhere. GMOs are safe, the method is very safe. If anything, it's a safer way of breeding than the traditional methods where you typically don't know what genes are being exchanged. With the GM method, you know exactly what genes are going into the new plants. Already, this has been able to improve yields in South Africa for corn, where the army worm, the fall army worm was a major problem. Um, they now in South Africa grow GM corn to overcome this, 
And there are a number of other sub-Saharan African countries that are looking into doing the same thing. In Nigeria, you also have recently made GM cowpeas, which are a, a big plus. And there are many examples of this, but as was mentioned in the introduction, one of the things that the Nobel Prize winners have focused on have been golden rice. You know, something like between half a million and a million children die every year because they don't get enough vitamin C when they're growing up, vitamin A rather, when they're growing up. This is because they typically do not eat the foods that produce beta carotene that is the precursor of vitamin A. Some years ago, a couple of scientists in Germany decided they were going to improve rice, which is a major crop in many countries, improve it so that it would produce beta carotene in the grain of the rice. By so doing, those people who depended upon rice as one of their staple diet components <coughs> would get lots and lots of beta carotene, and then their bodies would make the vitamin A that was necessary to avoid blindness and to avoid a lot of autoimmune diseases. That was successfully achieved a long, long time ago, more than 20 years ago. And it's only this year, in fact, just about a month ago, that finally it was approved for commercial production in the Philippines. It is also close to being approved in Bangladesh, and I think will be approved in many other countries too, eventually. Here is a, a crop that really shows you that food is medicine, that if you eat golden rice instead of regular rice, you get beta carotene, and then you can get vitamin A and avoid the childhood problems that come if you're deficient in vitamin A. I think this is a great example of something that can be done because one could do the same thing for many other crops, <coughs> either introduce pharmaceuticals or just improve yields. And it's something that can be done <coughs> by scientists within Africa. You don't need to rely upon the West to help you with this. You have good scientists, you have all of the techniques and technical knowledge that is necessary in order to do this. And I think the sooner you convince the politicians or we convince the politicians that GM foods are safe, the better. We really have to tackle this misinformation that comes out. And a lot of the time that just means educating the politicians. And one of the things the Nobel Prize winners have been trying to do is to help to achieve that. We have 158 Nobel Prize winners, all proclaiming the benefits of GM technologies. Now, one of the things that came up during the introduction is the fact that in Nigeria, in, in many countries, the scientific resources are limited. There are not that many labs that are able to do this. And in particular, even within the universities that might technically be able to do it, they lack resources or they lack training. And I would just like to talk a little bit about that before I finish. You may or may not know about an organization called the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, ICGEB. It is based in Trieste. It also has a component in South Africa in Cape Town and one in New Delhi in India. This organization was set up specifically to help scientists and to train scientists from developing countries. Scientists who, who want to get involved in modern biotechnology can go to Trieste, they can go to Cape Town or to New Delhi, get trained, go back to their home countries, and then continue to get some support through ICGB. And I think this is something that is worth advertising more broadly 
than it is at the moment. There are many, many countries in Africa which are a part of the ICGB. I think there are some 70 countries altogether that are a part of it. And so you, your ministers of science, ministers of education should know about this organization. There are also many foundations like the Gates Foundation and others that are only too keen to help labs in Africa. If you need funding in order to get some equipment, in order to get them some things going, if you need help in getting scientific training, there are many organizations, many private foundations that will help you. And I think knowledge of just what is available is also something that would be worth disseminating widely within Africa. And finally, one of the things that I would like to talk to you about very briefly is that we have been thinking for a long time at New England Biolabs, at the company um, that I work for, that we want to do something for the developing world. We started many, many years ago bringing in scientists from countries in Africa or in Asia, training them at our headquarters in, um, in Massachusetts, and then sending them back to their countries after training with some money to help get started to start up a company. Now, the one thing that we thought would happen is that as soon as these people got going, that the local governments would realize what a value it was to have a, a small biotech company get started in their country and that they would put some money into that. But of course, that didn't happen. And so although we had a, a, what we thought was a good idea, um, we didn't really at the time have the resources to follow through and provide further funding to make sure that any companies that got started were successful. So we're now looking into a new enterprise, which we hope to start soon, which is to establish a company somewhere in Africa, we've not decided where yet, um, with a leader who is an entrepreneur, a scientist entrepreneur, who will start the company, start it small, perhaps making COVID tests, perhaps making oligonucleotides, making enzymes that are needed so that you can import them directly from Africa instead of having to go outside in order to do it. And we intend to set this up to fully fund it so that it can get started until such time as it can make money to support itself. We think that if we can do this and if it works well, then that will set a very good example for other US-based companies to do the same thing in other countries. And perhaps it will also serve as a good demonstration to the government of countries in Africa that they too, by putting in a relatively small amount of money, could get something useful going that would in fact start the biotech industry within their countries and not having to rely upon importing everything from abroad. So with that, I, I thank you for listening. I very much hope that you have a, an extremely successful conference and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sir Richard, uh, Sir Richard uh, Roberts. Again, it's an uh, honor to have you. Uh, like I mentioned earlier ago, uh, your state is, uh, you know, is state in Northern Nigeria and this is a milestone achievement. But this is not for me to say. I'm going to now um, give the floor to our leader, our father, and uh, the our mentor, collective mentor, uh, which, who is the uh, Yerba State Governor, Honorable May Malabuni, which who is heavily uh, represented by the Deputy Governor of Yerba State, Honorable E.D. Barre Gubana. Uh, I will give the floor to you, sir, for your remark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ahmed. All protocols duly observed are respected. Good afternoon, all of you, the participants on this program. I will thank Sir Richard John Roberts for finding time to speak at this symposium, despite his busy schedule. You will say he's deeply thrilled and honored to host such a high profile scientist. It is tremendous honor to have a Nobel Prize winner speak to this audience, an achievement attained by an extremely few scientists in their scientific careers due to their life-changing discoveries. 
your talk of this audience hosted by Yobese University is indeed a milestone for our state located far north of Nigeria. Sir Richard, we appreciate your enthusiasm and commitment to globalizing science. Your talk has been scintillating and thought provoking. We have taken notes of issues raised and will implement those that require local implementation. We indeed have pressing medical conditions that require research and the major setback is equipment and human resource. With this laboratory, we hope to have a team of active, active scientists that will work for our society's benefits in the area of chronic kidney disease that is rampant in Northern Yobe and help address global challenges. Yobe say will appreciate your support and that of the many respected scientists present in this meeting to implement other key points raised ensure by biomedical science and the research center BioRTC develops into a research and training center for repute in biosciences. Thus, we hope that you will continue engaging with us directly or through your network to facilitate the expansion and maturation, maturation of the lab, as well as exchange visiting program in our university and teaching hospitals. I would like to also appreciate the effort of Dr. Bukar Maina, who is an indigenous of Yobe State and is colleagues who work tirelessly to make this a reality. I learned that Dr. Maina has been working with training and research in natural science for development in Africa for nearly a decade, through which he has facilitated training and distribution of various equipment across Africa. Therefore, I will seize the opportunity to thank training and research in natural science for development and their entire team for supporting our son and indeed your state. Finally, I would like to thank, the, to thank and appreciate all other speakers across the world from the UK, Germany, United States, and Spain, etc., who agreed to speak in this symposium and ask them to support this initiative in terms of training and mentorship in whatever way possible to them. Thank you and God bless.